righty. Hi, everybody. How's everyone doing? Yeah? Uh, excellent. We're going to go ahead and get started, and then people might trickle in late, but we do have a bunch to get through. Um, most likely, we won't get through all the content that was for the reading today, but I've divided it up that on Friday, when we're going to be talking about climate-related displacement, we will finish off talking about relational tipping points that continue. So that'll be a segue between the two lectures. So just FYI. Um, and I'll add to this uh, slideshow so you'll see that continuous um, once it gets put on Canvas. Um, also, another disclaimer that if throughout the lecture you have a question, just raise your hand. I don't mind being interrupted, so I'd rather pause because most likely if you have a question, a bunch of other people might have that question. So I'm happy to like pause as we go along the way, um, even if that means we have to go a little bit slower. So feel free to do that if you need me to clarify anything. Okay. So today, um, you know, and we've been talking actually a little bit about maybe some of this content, uh, but not necessarily in this kind of framework coming off of Professor Pakala's lectures uh, the last couple. But as you know, you've had a series of lectures talking and detailing about the impacts of climate change and particularly looking at emissions. And I'm going to be focusing primarily today on looking at questions of responsibility and obligations, right, justice-based obligations for how we understand how to allocate responsibility in light of emissions and their impacts that come through with climate change. And so we're going to talk a lot about different kinds of principles that could ground how we allocate responsibility. And then as we go through this lecture into Friday, we'll look a little bit at a critique about whether we can even satisfy certain kinds of obligations of justice, especially in the context of when there's compounding injustices, uh, as in the case of colonialism. And then we'll look at a specific problem of which is the focus of my recent research, which is the problem of climate-related or climate-induced displacement, and sort of the case of climate refugees. And there'll be an interesting test case to examine one you know, major complex impact of climate change and to what extent we have responsibilities or whether we even do have obligations to address climate-related displacement. So that's kind of your trajectory for the week. So we'll just start to get into a little bit of a background um, today and outline some of these principles. So what I hope that you can get out of the lecture today is these couple of learning objection, uh, objectives. One that we want to understand global justice considerations within the context of climate change mitigation. So what are the responsibilities to mitigate or lessen the impacts of fossil fuel emissions in the atmosphere, right, the release of greenhouse gases, and the related costs that come with addressing those impacts? And so we'll be looking at a series of principles that underlie that responsibility. I'd like you to try to be able to differentiate the different grounds of these principles, what's different between them, and to maybe understand a little bit about some of the strengths of a particular view and maybe some particular weaknesses or objections that could rise in light of that view. And it'll be interesting for you to reflect whether you even have some intuitions that lean towards one account of this responsibility or another, and maybe that can help you to understand the reasons for why you might you know, be holding on to a certain claim about how you think uh, certain people should be held responsible for climate change. Another thing I'd like you to get out of this lecture is also understanding responsibility and global justice's discussion of adaptation to climate change. So we'll talk a little bit about in the background of this responsibility conversation about the difference between mitigation and adaptation. But just briefly, even if we are able to lessen right, the impacts of climate change, we're still looking to hit, you know, if we're doing everything that Professor Pakal has been talking about, to hit a 1.5 degree increase, but that's going to be very difficult. Most likely we're going above into other thresholds, at least right now, if we stay on the status quo trajectory of the business as usual. That means that we won't be as good, right, at lessening the impacts of climate change. So there will be requirements for adaptation as well. A di you know, different degrees of adaptation responsibilities required according to the different degrees that we might be hitting in terms of those different climate scenarios. And so there are questions of responsibility 
about who should be responsible for funding adaptation measures, right, or who primarily um, would we say, you know, are, are responsible for, for addressing that need to adjust. And then finally, wanting to understand the possible limits to achieving justice in the context of climate change. That's the component that I'll see that will stitch these two lectures together. So most likely we won't, won't get to this third objective today, but we will get to it on Friday. All right, so I want to give a little bit of a conversation about why talk about uh, global justice in the context of climate change. And maybe for some of you that have heard that term but don't necessarily know what it's referring to, to just give a, a quick overview. And so there are certain kinds of um, assumptions that in the reading were made that I want to kind of just highlight in light of talking about uh, global justice. And that is that justice involves certain kinds of moral considerations regarding the relationships between people or between people as they are mediated by certain kinds of institutions and policies. So what we're going to do today is just set aside the kinds of obligations we might have to, let's say, other non-human species, or to um, ensuring biodiversity, or our obligations to ecosystems. We're kind of just going to be talking about this people-to-people -people, uh, obligation requirement, and again, as those relationships are mediated by certain institutions and policies. So that's just an operating assumption that's happening in the background of the readings in my lecture today. We're also going to be looking at a particular kind of way in which we can conceptualize global justice in light of what's the most relevant way to think about it in terms of climate change. And so that's about thinking about it in terms of social justice. And that's kind of the framework within which some of the readings right, are engaging with that. And so you might ask, well, what, what kinds of questions is someone worried about global justice and the social justice framework with regards to climate change think about? So setting aside the climate change aspect, there are some general questions that can be examples of relevant global justice questions. So those, that is the question of whether duties of justice exist between people of different countries, meaning do you have an obligation of justice to non-citizens, right? people beyond the borders of your state? If you do, what would ground those duties? Why do you have obligations to non-citizens? And which principles best characterize the nature of that obligation? So what is the guiding principle that helps to underline why we have those duties? So those are some examples of general global justice questions that we're then going to apply in the case of climate change. Make sense? Yeah, OK, cool. OK. So climate change-related threats, as we know, result out of energy use. Uh, and these uncoordinated energy policies right throughout the world. And so historically, greenhouse gas emissions have been the highest in the industrialized world. You've been learning about that over the course of the semester, so I'm just kind of reviewing things you already know to remind you in this context why that's important. And we know that the use of energy and this energy expenditure that releases greenhouse gases bring a lot of benefits, right? benefits to states that have enabled them to industrialize and develop, to accumulate wealth, et cetera, et cetera. But fossil fuels also bring these climate change-related costs as we've been learning throughout the course. That's just you know, the conditions within which we're talking about. So there is a question of who is responsible for the costs of climate change, as well as the costs to adapting to it. And these are these global justice concerns. I want to flag that in addition to these kinds of questions, there is also a global justice consideration or concerns over how certain kinds of international treaties or policies are going to assign the costs of mitigation. So we're not just talking about you know, mere responsibility or who these agents are that are responsible, but to also evaluate whether certain kinds of institutional arrangements adequately distribute these costs or burdens. Um, and how they do so in light of or how they impact the eradication of poverty and economic growth in less developed or in developing countries or countries in the global south. So one question is whether or not how these certain institutional policies might play out. Do they maybe negatively impact countries that might be relying on certain kinds of emissions right, in order to develop? And that 
is maybe a deprivation that they would be facing that those that have already emitted a number of right, um, or historical emissions have already benefited from, right? Because they have been doing so historically and we're able to gain the wealth from that. So we want to maybe consider how institutionally in uh, distributing these benefits and burdens, there might be an impact or an unequal impact when we're going to see regulations and emissions and the costs of that. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about some of the kinds of duties um, that we might see if we think we have obligations to people that are not our fellow citizen. And there are going to be competing views, right? There's going to be a camp of views that thinks, well, absolutely we have obligations to people beyond our borders. And then there's a camp of views that say either we don't or those obligations to people outside our borders are weak or can be easily overridden by certain kinds of other considerations, right? particularly considerations of the sovereignty of a particular state or the, a state's right or a community within a state's right to um, self-determine you know, who that community is. So we'll get into a little bit of these kind of different camps and divisions. So <clears throat> I'm going to start with the camp of people <laughs> that argue um, that we don't have duties to people outside our borders. So they can, those camp of views, like I just said, can mean that there are no duties or that they are pretty weak and can be easily overridden. Um, loosely, you don't have to worry too much about this term, but you might categorize these under the term non-cosmopolitan views. If you see that appearing in the literature, that can, that can be the kind of terminology that refers to these camp of views. And there are several different examples of how you could take up this view, right? The reasons for why you think there are no obligations to people outside of your state, right? So some folks think that you only have duties of egalitarian distributive justice. So you only have duties to make sure there's this you know, equal distribution of, let's say, resources if you are all under the same legal coercive uh, regime, right? So, or the same legal structure. So these folks think, well, you would only then have certain obligations to fellow citizens because we all are sharing within the same kind of set of laws, um, coercive laws, right, that, that implicate um, how we engage with one another. Since states are the only sort of agent that can uh, provide this kind of structure, this legal coercive structure, that means that we only have duties to people within that same state. When I'm saying state, I'm using it loosely to mean country, right? So a sovereign, independent nation that has jurisdiction over its own territorial uh, area. Okay, so this one example of why we don't have duties to people outside is, well, they don't share the same kind of coercive set of laws, right, as you do within a state, and so we can't have distributive, dis distributive egalitarian distributive justice duties there. Some folks argue that you actually, to even understand the content of your obligation to somebody in, along these lines, you would need some sort of shared cultural understanding um, of the kinds of goods that need distribution. And only states can really provide that kind of shared understanding. So presumably, all of us might have some common or shared understanding about the kinds of things that we think we should all um, have maybe equal access to. That might be distinct if you were in another country. And so therefore, we wouldn't even really be able to assess the content of the obligation if we're talking about then owing something to some country over, people in some country over there. There is a kind of third way to understand why we don't have duties to people outside this country. And that's that maybe those duties would come in conflict with this national self-determination, which is what I was just recently talking about. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about that in the climate refugee case. So for example, there, you know, according to this kind of camp of views, um, people within a particular nation or a particular state have this right to self-determination. They have the right to decide who's included in the state you know, and, and what the kind of makeup of the state looks like, of its citizens, et cetera that that should probably dominate 
or overwrought, or that would be maybe dominated or overridden if we were to say, hey, I know you usually have the right to you know, determine who is able to come into your state, but look, there's this case of people displaced by climate change, and in fact, other kinds of obligations we have require you to actually take them in, meaning it's going to override your right to determine who's coming in or who's not. Right? So that'll be an example of that kind of tension. So people that think we don't have duties to people outside our country are worried about this conflict between these issues of national self-determination and competing cosmopolitan obligations. OK. Um, so I'm just for the sake of time, those are just some examples. I want to kind of talk about the different approach of people that think, no, no, in fact, even though we have obligations to fellow citizens, we also have obligations to people beyond our state. So there is a you know, camp of views, and they take different kinds of forms, just like the um, non-cosmopolitan duties. So these might be understood as cosmopolitan views. And again, there's kind of different flavors of them, and I wanted to give you a little bit of an example of a few of them. So some views right, that think that we owe stuff to people that are non-compatriots or non-citizens think that we have duties of social justice that are owed by each person to all other persons, right, regardless of their citizenship status. What's like a very obvious maybe example which you would appeal to of why or what we owe to people regardless of whether or not they're a citizen? I'll say that question a little clearer because maybe it wasn't. Um, What's a kind of right that might be universal, that we all hold, that doesn't matter whether or not you're a citizen of one country or another? Are there a camp of rights? Yeah. Good, OK, so a certain kind of right to life. So a right to life might be an example of what kind of right? Yeah, excellent, good. So human rights views think that there is a certain right set of rights that attach to you regardless of your status of whether you're you know, a compatriot or not. So human rights views might be an example of this idea, uh, of this cosmopolitan idea that we're talking about. And so parts of these views might think that, hey, one right that you know, everyone should be afforded is the right to accessing certain kinds of means of subsistence, right? having enough resources to be able to survive, right? And it doesn't matter whether or not you're a citizen of X country to Y country, that it's each of us having an obligation to one another in virtue of that human rights framework. Another example is that maybe we don't have duties to everybody in that expansive way, but we definitely have duties that are wider than just seeing them as within the same legal framework as the other camp of views thought. So for example, how might you relate to people or uh, in another country? What kinds of maybe transactions happen maybe indirectly between citizens of one nation and another in which you go beyond just the legal frameworks of your own country? Like, has anyone ever bought stuff not from the US? Okay, right, so, I mean, sometimes it's hard, right, to, to just buy within the state. So there could be certain kinds of economic associations that are beyond the sort of state law, in, you know, national laws that um, could maybe ground our duties to other people. So this camp of view that says, you know, we have duties to people beyond our state might say, well, maybe we don't have duties to everyone, but maybe we do have duties to people based on these other kinds of engagements beyond just the legal parameters of our own state. So that could be, for example, like I just said, certain kinds of economic associations. Uh, another group of this view of why we might have obligations to, to people that are non-compatriots is that we have this idea that we are all globally sharing the resources of the Earth, including the Earth's atmosphere. So there are certain views called common ownership views that think that in light of this common ownership of the Earth's resources, 
we then have obligations to one another based on us sharing right, this larger pie. And we'll talk about some common ownership justification for why that means we have an obligation to take in climate refugees. So that'll be an example that's gonna ground a certain principle in that case. And I'll talk a little bit more about this um, in the next slide. But then finally, another justification, so I'm like throwing at you like five different flavors of the reasons why you might think we have obligations to people outside our country, is this idea um, that the inequalities in wealth and in income should maximize the benefits, or rather should maximize the benefits to the least advantaged people. So this idea, right, that if there's going to be inequality, it should be thus that the people that are least well off are benefited. Some people think that that idea, that principle applies globally. So it applies on a global scale, not just to the citizens within your country. So that's a kind of another framework. So on this slide, I kind of summarize the different kinds of versions that you could have of this argument. And of course, they have disagreements with each other. Some have advantages, some have some weaknesses. And you're already off to the races, both within a certain category or then against the view that think you don't have obligations to people that are not fellow citizens. OK, so one thing that um, before we kind of move on, whoops. I don't know why that's in there. Oh no, did it go back? Okay, I don't know why that happened. So um, I do wanna talk a little bit about human rights. We brought it up a little bit. It's so weird that, um, yes, okay. I do wanna talk a little bit about the way in which a human rights framework might come into play, right, when assessing climate change. Um, and when assessing the responsibilities that we have in light of that, it was just raised, right, as one possible reason or grounding for why we might have obligations to non-compatriots or non-citizens. And so if <clears throat> we are successful at mitigation, you know, we're still, like I mentioned, gonna have these various kinds of impacts. And if we're not really successful at mitigation and already, right, we're failing to do the appropriate things, we're already seeing and we'll continue to see bad impacts right, on people. And so we might want to understand those bad impacts of people as human rights violations. So one fundamental wrong of climate change could be the fact that right, it causes these human rights violations. Way back earlier when I first lectured, we didn't get to it in lecture, but I had had you read Simon Caney's view of human rights, and so he is addressing understanding climate change as a moral problem insofar as it violates human rights. So that's an example of one of these kinds of views. And human rights figure really prominently in the literature of global justice because they establish these requirements of what we owe, like I just talked about on the last slide. And so um, we might consider a human rights approach as, an, as a helpful or beneficial way to try to get at why we have responsibilities for climate change. Um, so some possible requirements of a human rights approach might say that, hey, as I just mentioned, a state might say, well, I have sovereignty, so I have control over what happens in my borders, including who gets to come in and who gets to not. A human rights-based account might say, well, there exists a human rights violation, right, that's happening because of climate change, and because of that, your claim of sovereignty, your claim, let's say, to close your borders down, may not be justifiable. It could be overridden because there is a human rights violation that's happening that might require you right, to alleviate it by, let's say, taking people in to your borders. Right? So that will be an example right, with the climate displacement case. Um, human rights views might also have a requirement that we ought to eradicate extreme poverty and global inequality. And we also know that um, if you have this involvement of a human rights account and understanding the moral wrong of climate change, that kind of view would be within the scope of a global justice view because it's you know, grounding the fact, like I've been saying, that it justifies obligations beyond borders. <clears throat> 
So this is at play, right? And it seems like a plausible and maybe helpful view to understand why we have responsibility. But some people do think that a human rights account may not adequately account for the whole of this challenge of allocating responsibility. So I just wanted to put that on your radar, that a human rights account might have a difficult time in addressing obligations that we would have to future people, maybe to future people that are not going to exist for some time. So there is this question of intergenerational justice and whether a human rights view is the best way to account for intergenerational justice. And then there's lots of different reasons why it may not be able to account for it. Some people you know, talk about maybe the needs right, of future peoples being something different or distinct, in which case we might not have an adequate conception of the kind of rights that would be categorized as human rights. So there's a range of, of maybe limitations with regards to intergenerational justice that a human rights framework might struggle to manage. But if you were going to defend a human rights view of you thinking that it's because of our obligations to human rights of why we should then have responsibility to mitigate climate change, one thing that you could do is address this objection, right? You could say, okay, I'm gonna think about how a human rights view might be adequate to address certain kinds of obligations in the context of intergenerational ethics. So that, that's a project, right, that you wanna take up. Okay, so I wanna get into the meat of stuff after some of that background and talk about these different kinds of guiding principles of responsibility. You know, we kind of just did this larger overview of human rights uh, views being one way to frame the moral wrong of climate change and then also to be, you know, having the kind of force to determine responsibility. Um, so I'm actually interested on just your intuitions about this or whether you have certain kinds of views already formulated and then we'll see if they connect to any of the views that we're gonna talk about. So, you're gonna have a clicker question. Um, so you should take out the stuff for a clicker. And I want you to answer this question, you know, to the best of your ability according to what you think. Maybe as you were coming into this class or over the course of the class. So how do you think responsibility for greenhouse gas emissions should be assigned? In other words, like what is the basis for responsibility? Why should someone be understood as responsible? Is it A, because those, have a better, those that have a better ability to pay for the cost of emissions are the people that should be held more responsible in their ability to pay? Is it because someone has, you know, or a state has historically emitted more that they should be responsible? Is it those who knew they were emitting that should be responsible? So the fact that they knew they were doing it, does that mean that's why they're on the hook? Is it because they benefited from those emissions that makes them responsible? Or is that um, those who historically emitted are more responsible regardless of whether they knew they were emitting? So knowledge is not necessarily a requirement. So let me turn this on. Uh, oh. This one? Okay. Is that working? when I push results, okay, well, I don't wanna influence their, their priors, so I'll show after. <laughs> yeah. If you wanna add into what you think. <laughs> uh, let's see. Okay, looks like we're stopping, oh, no, still a few more people, who's holding out? Right on, okay. Do I pause it to click the results? Or just, just click results? Huh, interesting. So let's see this, uh, this distribution. Is anyone uh, surprised by this? Yeah, interesting. I mean, I don't know if you've been talking outside of class, but here's, here's an interesting thing that um, we don't have widespread agreement in class here about how uh, responsibility should be allocated. So it looks like a chunk of you, it's almost you know, pretty even distribution right across all of these. This is gonna make for good deliberation and debate, right, <laughs> if we're talking about these kinds of principles. So let's get into these views. And then we'll see if you change your mind or you see the force or strength of, a, of, of an argument that has you revise your commitment to this. All right. Whoops. Uh, 
There we go. Okay, so um, <clears throat> some people think <laughs> that uh, a morally acceptable international treaty or policy would be one that would distribute responsibilities of states according to their historic contributions uh, to emitting CO2 and other greenhouse gases. Okay, so this can, this, you know, description, this general description and this idea can be understood as the polluter pays principle. Pretty obvious in the title, but here is, you know, a short kind of statement of what that principle says. So those who pollute should pay, so there's the ought claim about what they're morally required to do, in proportion to their contribution to the overall pollution problem or to overall emissions. So your responsibility, right, is measured in light of your contribution with your emissions to adding to the problem. So if you're a bigger polluter, you're going to be what? More or less responsible? More or less? More, OK. I'm just seeing if you're listening. OK, so um, <clears throat> there are different ways that you can defend this principle. So of course, as you've been seeing, there can be various different reasons for why people might agree that this is a principle of responsibility that we should follow, but they might have different reasons, right? So they agree on the conclusion that the polluter pays principle is an adequate principle of responsibility, but they might differ in why they think that's the case. And so different people take kind of two different camps of views in this. And you, can, you might yourself, right, when you answered the question that I just asked, the clicker question, might fall into some of these camps or views. So maybe start to listen to see where you fall along these spectrums. So one way in which you might think that responsibility should be allocated by um, this polluter plays principle, you can take the route that says that there are a certain um, fault that can be assigned. So fault itself is what's going to ground the responsibility. And then there's a set of views that say that there are grounds right, that generate the responsibility coming out of the polluter praise principle that doesn't rely on allocating fault. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the distinction between those things. So to be at fault, and this is kind of uh, maybe equivalent to torts, if, for those of you that are familiar. You have to satisfy a number of conditions or a number of circumstances in which we can say you are guilty, right, or you're at fault for a particular kind of um, harm or wrong. So there are um, these different conditions. One is causation, one is voluntariness, and one is knowledge. So these conditions, if they're all satisfied, we're usually able to say that you're at fault. So just briefly, to be at fault, that you, as the agent, have to bring about the circumstance of which responsibility is assigned due to your actions. So that's what we mean by causation. It's your actions that brought about the thing that we're then saying you're responsible for. So that's that first condition. The second condition is that you had to have done so voluntarily. So we might say you're at fault if you know, it wasn't because you had a gun to your head to do it, right? It was a voluntary action. And then we will say that you're at fault if you knew, or similarly, any reasonable person would have known the consequences of your action and you did it anyway. So we often say, right, especially in tort, right, that if these conditions are all met, if you caused it, if you did it so voluntarily, and if you knew or had any reasonable person would know that it would bring about the bad thing, you are at fault. So some folks say it's that fault, right, that you are having that helps to ground why you are the one, as the increased polluter, right, to be able to be responsible to pay for the costs of mitigation. So this is kind of um, similar to maybe some sorts of retributive accounts of punishment, where like we need to know that causation happened and that like the agent was in with a certain kind of like mental state um, when they acted. And so when we assign responsibility to those that we know voluntarily and knowingly create problems, one advantage right, that this kind of approach would take is that when you set things up this way for responsibility allocation, you're actually establishing certain incentives 
that would hopefully reduce misdoings because people would be like, oh no, I know I'm gonna be held responsible right, if I meet all these conditions, so maybe I'm not gonna do that thing. And it also lowers the costs that some person's misdoing, right, or problem that they're causing would be passed on to others. So that's like an externality that might be able to be addressed. And so, you know, that, that can be a, a direction that you take, right, in light of this polluter pays principle. Um, there are then a group of views, and these might have been reflected in how you answered the clicker question, that say that, well, we're still going to subscribe to the polluter pays principle, but I don't need to find out or even be able to determine fault in order to guarantee the obligation. There's going to be other things that help me to determine the obligation is there. So there's a couple examples. We're going to focus on a third one, but I'll, I'll, I'll talk about these two really briefly. There's this strict liability. You know, you don't necessarily have to worry about that term. But that's the idea that you could be responsible regardless of whether you acted with knowledge of what you were doing. So those of you that clicked like, well, they're still responsible. The people that are more responsible for emissions, right, uh, are responsible regardless of whether they knew they were doing it or not. So you would be fall falling into that category if you answered that question that way. Then there's a camp of views that again, it doesn't matter whether or not we find you at fault, it's just that you're responsible because you benefited from your emissions. So the mere fact that there was a benefit from you emitting more means that you are responsible. So what this view does, and if you had answered the question in this way, it means that you're, you don't really necessarily uh, care about this causation condition but ra so you're not really trying to establish right fault in that you being the cause of the action is not the reason why you have the responsibility. It's that you benefited from the emission. Okay. So these various different views, either if you're trying to find fault or if you're not to, to uh, ground the polluter pays uh, obligations that emerge out of the polluter pays principle, they each have their own limitations. And so what I'm kind of doing is trying to show you, like, this is a particular view you might actually have, and there are certain reasons for why they hold these views, and there are some people that are going to argue that there are certain weaknesses that maybe this view is not the best view to go. So in general, right, there could be um, a number of, I'm just going to lump the fault and non-fault together, of issues. So in terms of assigning fault, right, where you're needing to satisfy those three conditions, Remember the causation, the knowledge, and the voluntariness? There's difficulty in doing that when it comes to climate change. As you've learned with Professor Pakala's lectures, uh, CO2 lasts a really long time in the atmosphere. So some of the emissions that have been produced by people, uh, those people are no longer alive, right, given how long CO2, the radiative energy of CO2 lasts in the atmosphere. So there's no way to actually recoup costs from those individuals. They literally don't exist anymore. So trying to find fault, well, falling to fault with who? Like dead people, right? There might be some problem there. It also could be that at least, as, you know, with regards to early emissions, especially a lot of the, you know, countries to industrialize quicker, they didn't really know that those emissions were going to be a problem. And so satisfying the knowledge condition, at least for early emissions, might be difficult. So these might be some challenges if you wanted to res assign responsibility in virtue of fault, right, on the polluter pays principle. Some people say, oh, we can get around those problems. It's because you're thinking of that view in terms of like individuals, like literally individuals who have died, or individuals, whether they knew what they were doing. Forget having an individual account. Let's just think of fault and assign it to states, right, nations themselves. Because at that point, we're able to maybe get around this idea that the people responsible are no longer existing because the state is still persisting. So we can assign responsibility there. And that we might be able to deal with problem number two um, because you know, we're not necessarily dealing with the sort of individual decisions that were made earlier on that required that kind of knowledge component to be satisfied. Uh, then the people. I'm playing out the debate, right, if that you're going to have over Thanksgiving with your parents, is that, um, well, assigning the responsibility to states instead of individuals doesn't really solve all the issues or challenges to going this direction. 
um, because some states that might be responsible for emissions like didn't exist uh, at a particular point, right? Um, or because maybe the knowledge condition of those states wasn't satisfied at that particular time. And then another kind of big camp of objections to this, this way to go is that there's a lot of practical barriers where inevitably, even if you're assigning responsibility onto states, the burdens get shifted onto citizens, either through increased taxes or something like that. So it's still individuals that are gonna suffer the costs um, for mitigation. Okay, so you might think, well, shit, okay, let's go with the other camp of views. Let's go with not having to establish whether there was uh, causality, knowledge, and voluntariness. Let's go with maybe those views that say uh, it was because you benefited or, um, so talking about these groups, or that you were responsible regardless of if you had knowledge. So some people say, well, with regards to strict liability, so this first one, of whether you acted with knowledge of you know, what you were doing, that that shouldn't be necessarily a condition that has to be met for responsibility. Some people might say, well, that seems like an unfair requirement because the agent that you're holding responsible didn't get enough right, notice to be able to know that um, they should be you know, wary of whether or not uh, there are uh, these kinds of requirements and responsibilities. So there's, there's these issues of fairness that come up in this view. And then um, there are some pushback on the whether or not you benefited makes you more responsible. Um, sometimes we don't have a say over whether you benefited or not. It could just have come along with it, but you personally Right, didn't have a lot of control over the benefit happening to you. Right, so it would be weird to assign you responsibility. So that's some objections to that. Okay, um, I want to turn to a final principle that can fall into the camp of like not having to find fault. So this is another principle that, um, <clears throat> sorry, another way to ground the ability to pay principle that doesn't require you to you know, satisfy the conditions of causality, um, and voluntariness and knowledge. And that's this idea that if you can pay, <laughs> so those of you that clicked A on your clicker, that means that you can take, the, the more that you can pay, right, the higher responsibility that you should have. So you're assigning responsibility in proportion to some agent's capacity. So we're not going around on this view looking for people that are at fault for their wealth. Rather, it's just the mere fact that the wealthy have a greater ability to pay for certain provisions and goods and services that they are on the hook. So oftentimes, right, this is allocated like within trying to deal with like inequality within a state, right? That's why I put, you know, AOC's controversial dress you know, up here, but this idea of taxing the rich right, is, is an idea that's subscribing to this. Well, the rich have the greater capacity to afford you know, the provision of these services, so therefore they're responsible. We can kind of have that writ large thinking about it on a global scale with global responsibilities. Those states that have more financial capacity to afford the costs of mitigation and adaptation are responsible in virtue of that proportional capacity. So there's some advantages of this view I'm gonna run through quickly, um, and then uh, maybe some challenges to it, and then we'll leave it there and we'll say like, okay, so we have all these different foundations that could possibly help ground these uh, justice obligations, and next time we'll look at like, even in light of all of these, we may not be able to achieve justice, uh, especially to particular communities. But for right now, what might be some strengths of this ability to pay principle? Why might it be good to, uh, to understand responsibility in light of the fact that there's this proportional responsibility based on capacity? Well, if you're thinking about certain things uh, in global justice that you find is important, it's fair, right? <laughs> um, on a lot of global justice views um, that we say that we should eradicate poverty and deep inequality with people in the world, right? So we're trying to achieve this kind of um, reduction of inequality, and that this principle, right, kind of embodies that, that kind of idea within some of these global justice arguments. 
And uh, these certain kinds of considerations of distributive justice, how we're distributing resources right, and burdens um, in this kind of a way, seems more relevant for our considerations, especially with climate change, rather than fault, given all the difficulties with fault finding that we just talked about. Another advantage of this view is that it seems like certain kinds of um, conventions that we already have seem to support this idea. So the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and the treaty that came out of that in 92, they have some language in there that seems to embody right, this idea of the ability to pay principle. And that's, um, and I'll read some of it, some you know, modified quote, that the treaty affirms assigning burdens to parties on the basis of equity in accordance with common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities. So that we are going to see a difference in the level of responsibility according to the different capabilities right, of the agents or the parties that we're talking about. Also within this framework, right, in the convention, is this idea that there's a right to sustainable development. And so the least developed countries should be allowed to get out of poverty through growth, so we wouldn't want to have policies that would limit that. So that's why it seems to make sense that the costs really should be borne by those that have already developed. And then so finally, some issues with assigning responsibility to states, or, or sorry, some challenges with the ability to pay principle is, uh, again, this debate about, well, what is the agent of responsibility? Are we saying it's individuals or states? That's something that comes up in the literature. Um, is this conception of responsibility the best to solve certain kinds of practical problems? So what would it look like right, to assign uh, responsibility according to this principle? And some folks think, opposed to some that argue in favor of this view, that it actually brings up some questions about fairness that are problematic. So there are questions about, well, should wealthy people in poor states benefit? Because it seems like they would from this view. Or are we going to see burdens being pushed to poorer people in developed states? So this is some worry that a lot of folks that are arguing for ability to pay principles try to contend with. But I wanted to throw some of those out there um, as possible problems. OK, uh, I have like one or two more minutes. So I just actually want to get to this last bit, that there's this view that you might hear from certain kinds of NGOs um, and you hear some you know, moral philosophers talking about it, which is this idea that we have an equal entitlement to emissions. And I just want to throw it out there because you might hear it, and I want to just show a couple problems with it, and we'll pick up with this um, next time. But this is the idea that each person has an equal entitlement to emit CO2. And so emissions reduction regimes, like what we should do to you know, lower these emissions costs, should honor that equal entitlement we all have by distributing the amount of emissions we're all allowed on this equal per capita basis. So you all get your unit of emissions right, equally. So if you overshoot that, you're already encroaching now on the property of your fellow citizens or someone else. So this operates on the assumption that we maybe all have collective ownership. All of humanity has collective ownership over the atmosphere. And so if you're going over your CO2 allotment, you're cutting into somebody else's piece of the pie. It sounds like pretty fair, right, up front. It seems like this view cares about human equality. But some folks say, well, not so fast. It seems like it's only really focusing on this equality of like distribution of resources. But that doesn't always track human equality, right? Different people might need more or less resources being distributed in order to find that kind of a equality. And different needs might require different emissions. So maybe this isn't tracking equality uh, sufficiently in that we might see a problem with it. And in fact, those who had a greater share in creating the problem or who have benefited more from emissions, maybe they should be entitled to the same amount of emissions as everybody else. Right? So why have this assumption that there's this kind of equal sharing of emissions that should be distributed? OK, so I'm going to stop here so you're not late for your next class. We'll talk briefly about these have all been responsibilities for mitigation. We're going to talk about similar issues with adaptation and then get into climate displacement issues. Thanks, everybody.